Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only means. We just thank you for the opportunities that you give us to come together to feast upon your word. We know that you prayed, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish, seal to our hearts that which is truth only. For we long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the second letter to the Corinthians verse by verse. Um, we came out of 1 Corinthians understanding that this was a church that was, uh, God clearly stated that they were acting fleshly, acting carnally, and yet He lavishes upon this group of believers the most tremendous uh, amount of grace that you could probably find anywhere in Scripture. And we come to 2 Corinthians, and we it, naturally it starts out that Paul was an apostle by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. There's a lesson there, an application there for us, and uh, he goes on to say to all of the saints, uh, it's addressed to every saint, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's verse 2. I believe we pick up in verse 8 here. And I, I just want to cover two verses in this video. Uh, that doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, those two verses, I believe, just go drive right at the very heart of the Christian's walk. Uh, they've always been very comforting verses to me. I hope you'll find them, find them comforting as well. Uh, I'll be looking at uh, the King James. I'll be looking at the Berean Study Bible. And of course, I'll be, uh, I've opened up the Greek interlinear for this text. I'm, I, I intend to try my best to lay some groundwork for these next few verses. So I ask that you bear with me here. First thing that I want to talk about is, as far as groundwork is concerned, is our identification with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. It is a topic that uh, has been very little, I believe, talked about, very little understood. Uh, almost every Christian knows that Christ uh, died for them. They may not quite understand uh, the difference between Christ dying for them and dying in their place, but as it concerns the matter of redemption, uh, justification, being made righteous through uh, the death and resurrection of Christ, I'm going to suggest, as, as others have, and I believe they're correct, that the truth concerning His death in our place, just as much as that is indispensable to our justification, our dying with Christ when He died is just as important when it comes to the matter of sanctification. Scripture declares, dearly beloved, that when Christ died, you died with Him. Now you know, and I know, both of us know, I think would have to admit, that's not a, a common topic discussed among Christians today. And yet it is, it is clearly outlined in numerous verses of the New Testament, Romans chapter 6, uh, Colossians chapter 3, uh, Galatians chapter 2, uh, as well as other places. Dearly beloved, when Christ died, you died with Him. When He was buried, you were buried with Him. When He was raised, you were raised with Him. You're said to now be co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That means that you probably ascended with Him. He's with you now forever. He'll never leave you an orphan. And when He returns, we'll be with Him. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What does it matter that we died with Christ? That we were crucified with Christ? Well, Galatians explains it quite clearly. You know, uh, it is... Uh, it is because it is, the, and it refers to this as the life that we now live in the flesh. We live by the faith of the Son of God, not our own faith, but the faith of the Son of God, that He's faithful. Our faith will often fail. Uh, this is how we live. This is how we walk. If we, and I, I, I don't really want you folks to do a whole lot of jumping around, but in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19, For I through the law died to the law, that I might live to God. Unless we die to the law, we cannot live unto God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And, and I, I can only imagine the number of Christians who would read that and really not quite grasp the significance of the fact that we don't live. Oh, we live but in the sense of our walk, our relationship with Christ, and when it comes to service and worship, we don't live, but it, it's not the li our life that's manifest, it's Christ's life. The life that I now live I, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness, see we're looking at, at, at practical righteousness here, not imputed righteousness. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Many Bible teachers will refer to these uh, aspects of our death with Him, our burial with Him, our resurrection with Him as, as the identification truths. We have been so closely identified with Him that He took our old man, our old self, our uh, rotten, sinful nature down into death with Him. That death did not eradicate that sinful nature. That's clear from Romans chapter 7 where we see the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. It was not God's intention to eradicate it and that gets to the very heart of what we're going to discuss this morning in our present study. If God had eradicated the sin nature and we were all just, uh, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't ever do anything but righteousness, we all we... We were just a single-natured individual, which we were just as just like Christ. And basically, you're looking at a bunch of little Jesuses running around. Where would be the need for trials? Where would the need be for faith? As, as upset as Christians get, and my heart goes out to them, for that ugly manifestation of self and sin in the life of the Christian, God could have eradicated it, annihilated it. But, but our death with Christ does not mean that. What it means is, is as far as service and, and function, our, the way we function and our service for the Lord, um, there's nothing good that dwells in the flesh. We died, dearly beloved, to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. You don't hear that talked about, but those are clear marks of Scripture that, that guide our lives into that area which we call, might refer to as progressive sanctification. How should we then live? If we've died to sin, self, law, the world, Satan, and even death, how should we then live? And self is an ugly monster every time it rears its ugly head. I don't think any rational Christian would ever uh, suggest 
that the sin nature that we carry along with us because that we're going to our bodies someday will be redeemed we're looking in fact we're looking forward to the redemption of our bodies or that that's not the case but in the meantime it's an awful thing it's an awful thing to have to live in the body of sin and death. who shall deliver me from the body of the sin and death i thank god through jesus christ my lord so that so then i with my mind serve the law of god but with my flesh the law of sin that's the end of chapter romans chapter 7. we're looking at paul and his companions here uh, i think the reference to their missionary journeys are quite evident and when we begin at verse 8 we do not want you to be unaware brothers of the hardships we encountered in the province of asia we were under a burden far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life and uh, if you go to the next verse verse 9 indeed we felt we were under the sentence of death in order that we would not trust in ourselves but in god who raises the dead and folks there is a lot to unpack in those two verses we do not want you to be unaware we don't want you to be ignorant this is something and, and keep in mind as i've suggested often this is god the holy spirit not paul saying that he does not want us to be unaware of something it's a present tense it's a present participle do not be unaware uninformed ignorant of something here in in the present tense of the hardships we encountered in the province of asia this is a direct reference to his missionary journeys him and his companions they did encounter hardships he says we were under a burden far beyond our ability to endure well now wait a minute i thought with god all things are possible all things are indeed possible in our lord jesus christ but not in the flesh we were under a burden O wretched man i am think romans 7 here that which i want to do i don't do i do the very thing i don't want to do you know uh, what uh we know the law is spiritual but i'm carnal sold under sin for that which i do i allow not for that i would that do i not but what i hate that do i i am sure that many of my listeners can relate to that if then and i know i'm not in our current text i'm, I'm in i'm in romans here if then i do that which i would not i consent unto the law that it's good now then it is no more i that did it but sin that dwells in me and you have every right as a christian to say that the sin in you that is not i that sins but sin which dwells in me because you are a new creation in christ why is that true because you're a new creation in christ and in, in whom he, he his seed abides in you and you cannot sin we're a dual natured individual if we weren't there would be no conflict if we have an old man and a new man we're a new creation in christ who is in possession of an old man and new man that's three people that's three persons right there uh, grammatically that's three persons you're not your old man you're not your new man you're a new creation in possession of both an old and a new man it would be inconsistent with scripture to suggest that you are a new man no you're a new creation in possession of a new man the holy spirit through paul in romans says that I, I know that is, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good i find not 
how to perform that which I would, or that which is good, I find not. Folks, I think this is what we're going to be looking at when we go back to 2 Corinthians and verses 8 and 9. I think that's what it's, it's describing. Because when Paul says that we were under a burden far beyond our ability to endure, I believe he's thinking of Romans 7. So that we despaired even of life. We despaired of life. Now you can take that as, well, what Paul is saying is he just, uh, he was, he was, he despaired of living, being among the living. He just, you wanted to die. And of course, there's a good argument, I suppose, for that. Paul clearly stated, or God stated through Paul, that it was much better to be with the Lord. That I, kind of th I think that the idea being that if Paul had had his druthers, he'd be, he would have rather been with the Lord, but he, he thought it necessary for their sakes that he remain. I don't think that that's the, that, the despairing even of life. Now you could say, now, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to admit here to you folks that you can go either way on this. The life that he despaired of is the old man, or the life that he despaired of that there was some despair in the life that he lived because he couldn't do what he wanted to do. In fact, he probably often did the very thing he didn't want to do. But the text, these verses here, 8 and 9, the text really clarifies what's going on here. He says, Indeed, we felt that we were under the sentence of death Now, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, says the King James Version. I believe that's correct. I looked at the, the original text, and it, the death, the sentence of death is not coming from outside, but in ourselves. This is why I wanted to begin this with some sort of a groundwork, some sort of a foundation of our understanding concerning our identification with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. We felt that we were under the sentence of death. What is was that sentence of death that was clearly stated to be in them? Not, not something external, but it was in them. And then you have a henna clause, a purpose clause, in order that, that that sentence of death was inside us, in order that, why? Well, the text is couldn't be more clear. That we shouldn't trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead. And that is really what it's all about, folks. There is nothing more important in this life than trusting God. I believe that is what God desires of us the most, is that we trust Him. But how are we going to, be, to trust Him if He doesn't bring circumstances and trials and hardships and, and despairs, even of, even of life, into our life, where the, we're under such pressure that we despair, even of life? Hardships, a burdens far beyond our ability to endure. Indeed, we felt we were under this sentence of death, that's, that being in ourselves in order that we not, would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And now, and automatically, we think, well, you know, okay, that's, you know, our resurrection. That's, that's someday. I hope it's soon. I don't think that's what it's talking about. In God which raiseth the dead. Second Corinthians 4 11 in the in the fourth chapter, we're not there yet. We're gonna read, for we which live are always delivered unto death. Now wait a minute. If if we're living, why would we be, need to be delivered unto death? Well, clearly, it's, it's for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The flesh profits nothing, folks. Nothing. 
It is Christ living His life in and through us. He the vine, we the branch. Accomplishing in and through us what we could not possibly do on our own, which I believe is what caused Paul to despair even of life. That sentence of death in themselves, or in, the application for us would be in ourselves. How wretched man I am. You know, this verse 20 in Romans chapter 7, I believe it's verse 20 that said, Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. How many, how many of you out there can honestly admit to yourself and confess before God that verse. If, if I do that, I would not. And that's going to happen. Often does. Happens every day, in fact. Can you say that it is no more you that sins, but sin which dwells in me? That the sin issue is forever settled. You were crucified with Christ. You died to sin, self, and the law which would at least make an appearance of trying to be holy in your life, in the flesh, okay? The law is holy. Make no mistake about it. And, and, I, and I beg you all to, not, to, to consider that what I'm not suggesting and that the, the law is not holy. The law is holy, okay? The law isn't sin. I wouldn't have known sin except by the law. For sin taking occasion by the commandment, law, because the, the law is the strength of sin in the believer's life, it deceived me and it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. The problem is not with the law. The problem is, was with us. Okay? Christ will feel the law perfectly. This word uh, in, in the Greek here, you know, for uh, completely disoriented. You know, the, if, if we go back and we look at our present text, the... Uh, the we were under a burden far beyond our ability to endure. Uh, under the sentence of death. That's the word. Is it's it has uh, it's a, actually a compound word, but it's 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 an intensified uh, word. Uh, there's no exit. You don't see any exit. You don't see any way out. You don't see any. Uh, it's f figurative. It, it means to lack adequate resources or solutions, okay? Leaving somebody in utter, complete despair. That's what the word means. That's what caused Paul despair. It's what causes us despair. It's Strong's 1820. It means completely disoriented. It emphasizes the, the, the end impact of having no solution, no way out, uh, leaving a person totally at a loss. It means incurring dishonor or shame in the eyes of men. It, so it, so it, it, it doesn't spring out of a, a reverence for right in itself, but from fear of the knowledge and the uh, opinion of men. Uh, we know that we are the, the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and we have no confidence in the flesh. We know this. Yet we continue on trying to have confidence in the flesh. Paul, if anyone should, should have ever had confidence in the flesh, would have been Paul. Circumcised the eighth day, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. As far as the law was concerned, so as far as people were concerned. 
It has the outward appearance. You know, I mean, a non-believer can feed the hungry, clothe the hungry, the poor, feed the hungry, or whatever you want to list there. But the plowing of the wicked is sin. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, what, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He counted all of that as rubbish to know Christ. Yet doubt, and I'm reading from Philippians 3 here, yet doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of, of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found that I may win Christ. You're looking at Paul, the God the Holy Spirit, through Paul, who is already, Paul is already God's child here. He's already re been redeemed. He was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. He belongs to God. He's one of God's children. And he says that I may, subjunctive mood, mood of uncertainty. Maybe I will, maybe I won't win Christ. And be found in... So what does he mean by that? And be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Oh, Paul, wait a minute. I thought you already knew Him, Paul that I may know Him. Know Him. And the word know is not oida, it's not perfect knowledge, it's gnosko, it's experiential knowledge and the power of His resurrection. The power of His resurrection. That same, folks, it's that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead works in you to raise you to life from, from dead works of self to the life that's in Christ. that I might know Him in the power of His resurrection in the fellowship of His sufferings. You're going to suffer in the same way. The hostility towards you from the sinful men. That the, the, I don't know, I can't think of an adjective that describes it properly. The, the wretched aggravation of the old man, the old self, the sin nature. Being made conformable unto His life? No. Being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might, might, attain to the resurrection of the dead. And the word in the Greek is only used once. It's out-resurrection. It's got the word, the prefix, ek. It's out of, it's out-resurrection, only used once of the dead. It's not talking about our future resurrection of the body. It's talking about that I might attain unto the resurrection of, dead, of the dead. We walk in newness of life, His life. It, we, it, we are raised from the dead to walk in newness of life now. Now. You know, the beauty of this is, is amazing. I... I, I I'm absolutely positive of one thing, and that is, that is I'm, I am not in any way, shape, form, or fashion, n n n tr I do not seem to have the words, I can't, the, the, because the, be the best words have already been spoken. All you got to do is read it. I, I don't, to paraphrase this, it's, it almost seems blasphemous for me to try to do so. I can't say it any better. We live resurrection life now. Okay? It's not something that we're going to, we need to wait. Look, listen. If you have a, a, sin, a sinless new man that cannot sin because his seed abides in you, and the whole Christian life is described as a picture in which we are raised with him to walk in newness of life now, you're looking at something that is far more exciting than just about anything that you'd probably hear taught today as it regards the Christian walk. Well, Steve, 
I know what the Christian walk is. It's, I just gotta, I gotta go through my Bible. I gotta look look at every command given me, and I just gotta perform that command to the best of my ability. Memorize the verses. Practice, you know, practice makes perfect, right? And 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 hopefully God will accept me, folks. That's law. Grace is you growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, not yourself, not your own abilities, not your own talents, not your own skills, not your own whatever. It's growing out of you, away from you to Christ. It's, it is you were put to death with Christ for a reason. That's because God isn't trying to clean up the old man. that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable. That is a present tense. It's an ongoing process of being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might, maybe I will, maybe I won't, attain unto the resurrection of the dead. But Paul presses on toward the goal. The text says, not as though I'd already attained, He's not talking about some future rap, uh, rapture or resurrection of his body to life. He, or he's talking about the present tense. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul wants his life to reflect the truth of what God says it ought to be. He wants to realize the life that God has designed and constructed for him to walk in. And that's not his own life. That's the, the life of Christ. The focus is on Christ. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended. Now this is the Apostle Paul. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And now back to our present text. Back to our present text. With a reminder of Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Folks, you can go into any church in the world and they're either going to be preaching one or the other. Not I, but Christ. Or not Christ, but I. I'm going to suggest, and I make no apologies, that the majority of Christianity today is living the latter not Christ, but I. If you really want to find peace, joy, rest, and strength for service and worship and prayer and everything else, you've got to understand that the whole picture is an exchanged life, yours for His. And now all of a sudden, Scripture bursts open and you understand things like you've never understood them before. Listen again. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. This is what God doesn't want us to remain ignorant of. Which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead. And He will raise the dead. But let me tell you folks, He's not hanging around waiting to raise you from the dead. While in the meantime, you're left to your own devices. You've been raised, buried, died, buried, raised with Christ that's true of every single Christian. 
There is a life there that you can walk in that is not your own, but, but, but belongs to, to Him. It's His, His life. Okay? We preach Christ. We preach Christ and nothing but Christ and Him crucified. I wish Christians today could understand the, the great significance in, in <coughs> between what we call the church today, was, which is unique. Unique. Okay? No Old Testament saint ever had the Holy Spirit living in them. No Old Testament saint was said to be crucified with Christ or buried with Him or raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. No, it was oldness of the letter, law. The whole testing ground for Israel and everything prior to Calvary, going back through time to the very beginning, the whole, not maybe perhaps all the way to the beginning, there was an age of innocence, a dispensation of innocence before the fall. But when the law came in, sin found me out. It, it, it's, it found me out. It proved me to be a sinner. That's what the law does. And that drives you to Christ. You don't have anywhere else to go, folks. Nowhere else to go. If law is not working in your life, you have nowhere else to go but to Christ. And I can assure you that you will, will find peace, comfort, rest, joy there every, every day of your life. God wants us to be comforted. He wants us to know that the life that we live is not our own. But there, but there are going to be days in which we despair of life itself because of that conflict between those two natures. I'm sure that Paul found himself on his missionary journeys with his companions in situations that he, of which he certainly had no control. Of course, God did. But he found himself despairing of life because he couldn't do what he wanted to do. He'd, he'd want, he, he knew that he, he... He saw himself doing things that, uh, that he didn't want to do and not being able to do the things that he did want to do. But that sentence of death, folks, is inside us. The text makes it absolutely clear we had the sentence of death in ourselves. It wasn't people were trying to kill us, though they were. Okay? I'm sure. I'm positive of that. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. We had a sentence of death, not... Not man's sentence of death. God's sentence of death in ourselves. And that's what every New Testament Christian believer in Christ has. You have that sentence of death in yourselves. God has nothing to do with the flesh. Look, I love you all. I truly do. We're going to pick up here next time. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.